So I wanted you guys to take a look at this story that I had actually read about a little while back, but I decided to do a video on it now um, just to kind of, you know, go over this as a topic that's of great concern. Um, there are a lot of questions, there's a lot of um, misconceptions and preconceived notions about epidurals, but um, I wanted to talk about this topic and show you guys kind of illustratively in this video, what are some of the other alternatives to epidurals? So natural births, which are becoming a more commonplace. So I want you guys to take a look at this video and check out how this person experienced natural birth and I want you to look at specifically how she prepared herself for natural birth. So it's not, again, it's not just something that you want to just start requesting the month before your delivery. It's something that you have to build up to throughout your pregnancy, not only through birthing classes, lamas, etc. You want to also be building up to a natural birth with your lifestyle. You want to have the right amount of physical preparation some light cardio and prenatal yoga they may work that into their everyday routine in preparation for labor and even before your conception so being prepared physically for pregnancy labor and delivery is super important if you're considering a natural birth Nina closed her eyes and imagined she was floating in the ocean the water lapping her body, the sound of waves hitting the shore, a relaxing melody in the background. She could almost feel the heat of the summer sun across her skin when a contraction began to ripple through her. Nina took deep, yogic breaths through the pain. Her partner held onto her and told her what a great job she was doing. The warm water of the birthing pool alongside her breathing helped take the edge off the pain. Nina continued her meditation. She was once again floating in the ocean and no longer in a birthing pool in her home with her partner and midwife beside her. This birth was everything Nina had hoped it would be. She was at home, surrounded by her own things in her own safe space. Being in familiar territory allowed her to feel fully in control of the birth in a way she wasn't sure she'd have felt had she chosen to give birth in a hospital. The whole experience was wonderful, and Nina believed it was because she had spent her pregnancy focused on doing things that would assist her during labor. Nina had practiced yoga for 15 years prior to her pregnancy. She'd continued this habit by going to prenatal yoga classes. The same muscles she stretched at yoga were then given regular, labor-stimulating massages by a qualified masseuse once her first trimester nausea subsided, Nina made sure she hit her daily 10,000-step target. Her walks in the local park kept her active and gave her plenty of fresh air. And even when she craved stodgy or unhealthy foods, Nina had kept to a healthy, balanced diet. At times, it had been difficult to keep to her regimen, but now, during labor, everything she'd done throughout the pregnancy was allowing her to feel relaxed and ready for the baby's arrival. She used the hypnobirthing techniques she'd studied to meditate through her contractions, maintaining the image of herself floating peacefully in the ocean in her mind's eye as another contraction began, followed by another and another. Before she knew it, the midwife was telling Nina to push, and within a few minutes, her beautiful, healthy baby daughter had joined her in the water. Nina scooped her daughter up and held her against her skin. The midwife told her how impressed she was and how her labor had went. This was Nina's first birth, yet she'd remained completely calm throughout. Plus, the labor had lasted a relatively short time for the first-time mother, 10 hours from first contraction to birth. The midwife believed years of yoga and the lifestyle choices Nina made had helped immensely in shaping Nina's labor. Nina had set out a plan for how she wanted childbirth to go, and it had went exactly how she had hoped. The pride Nina felt in her body's strength was huge. Holding the daughter she had brought into the world in her arms, Nina felt invincible. 
that birth story was so soothing, right? It felt like, like if I could be coached through a birth with that type of like soothing meditation, Lamaze voice, that that would be like, I wouldn't need any drugs. I feel like that was just such a uplifting story of, you know, like how a perfectly planned and, and perfectly you know, orchestrated home birth could go. Of course, that's not always the reality. And I wanna make it very clear to you guys that if you have a high risk pregnancy and high risk meaning that you had any type of prenatal complications or diagnosed conditions, you know, prenatal diabetes, high blood pressure, preeclampsia, you don't want to put yourself or your baby into any harm's way by, you know, not having delivery amongst healthcare professionals and um, specifically OBGYNs that can treat any condition that is uh, coming up, you know, during your labor or your delivery. They can diagnose it, treat it, monitor your baby, monitor you. Um, and again, also being amongst anesthesiologists, nurse anesthetists that can help with a safe delivery of your baby and just getting into, you know, action if there's any emergency or urgency, those actions that can be life-saving for you and for your baby. So I just wanna say that part. So as an anesthesiologist, I feel strongly about, you know, considering all those things before you decide to have a home birth. So if your pregnancy is super smooth and you have and you're very healthy like this particular person was, very fit, was um, prepared for a home birth from probably the moment of conception, then that would be ideal and optimal, you know, so that you can increase your odds of having a very successful and smooth home delivery. I know of women who've delivered at home and have had very beautiful experiences and wouldn't have it any other way. So I understand their perspective. And then again, as someone who labored and delivered three children without any epidurals, only again, because I was trying not to, is because I just didn't have time. But having that perspective, I can totally understand their viewpoint. And if you have within you some coping mechanisms, some skills that you've learned, some strategies for dealing with the pains of contractions and you're ready for that, then I think that that is great and amazing. And you know, I support that. But I just also want you guys to operate with, you know, some information and, you know, wisdom and insight into, you know, what could be some possible requirements for your life to be saved. You always want to make sure that you're putting yourself in a situation, yourself and your unborn child into a situation where you are supported in the case of any emergency. So I want you to be very well informed and that's why I'm making this video so that you can be well informed on the resources that are available and you know just what happens and what goes into when we're delivering anesthesia for delivery what goes into that the pros the cons and from there you can make your own informed decision and understand these are things that we need to have information on so you know it would be great to look into the reasons for you know why there's such a maternal health issue that is still pressing in our nation and you know around the world this is something that takes the lives of women all the time and we just need to understand why and every time I hear a story about you know a mother and an unborn child or you know someone who delivered recently postpartum having any issues with any morbidity or mortality um, in the perinatal period it's just very very saddening very shocking and it's just you know frustrating because I'm I'm thinking you know we're as a country you know we're advanced in medicine I believe that we're advanced at this point where we can pick up and detect issues early and treat them but it continues to happen so this is something that our nation and public health officials and doctors and scientists and researchers need to look into more closely and figure out you know why this is happening and try to figure out what we can do as a community in medicine to reduce and improve this so this is it's always held a very significant space in my heart the 
you know, issues that concern um, women and infants have always held a very significant space in my heart and mind all throughout my journey in medicine. So much so that I really wanted to pursue OBGYN as a specialty at one point, um, but then later I decided on an anesthesia. And then when I started with anesthesia, I really was heavily involved in obstetric anesthesia. Now, not so much so because I've taken on a little bit of a different role in the clinical space, you know, more of an educational role. So that brings me a little bit out of labor and delivery, but I've always felt, you know, whenever I'm there, whenever I'm dealing with that aspect, that it's a really tender space for me, very tender space for me. So that's why I wanted to kind of address this topic. Just looking at our country statistics compared to all these other developed countries, it's crazy. Like maternal mortality is still like that high for the United States. And I feel like in this day, we are seeing more and more, you know, the areas that are weak for our country and the place and the ways that you know, we've never probably opened our eyes to before. We've never been very much privy to. And many other rights, we are a superpower. This country does well many other ways, but in the ways that are really crucial to the health and well being of citizens, we have to do better. I would have to say. According to the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics, for 2018, the maternal mortality rate was 17.4 per 100,000 live births in the United States. That's horrible. So when you look at that, maternal mortality is unacceptably high as per the WHO. I mean, this is across the globe, um, but specifically in the United States, being one of the most developed countries, you know, having access to medicine and prenatal care should be first and foremost. So someone like me who for the first birth was thrown into that situation, I learned for my subsequent births, you know, how to prepare myself and to be ready. And I've noticed that in talking to other moms who've delivered pretty quickly or naturally, it's that they were preparing themselves throughout their pregnancy and they were physically very optimized or in their best shape before they became pregnant and also leading up to their delivery. So in hearing about, you know, like the recent birth, by Ciara of her beautiful son. I could imagine that her delivery probably was the smoothest thing ever because she was in the top physical shape. I mean, she's always been, but like she's someone who's just like, in my mind when I think of like, you know, women that are physically fit and just always have like a great, you know, lean body mass and great tone about them, I always think about her. So I can imagine that, you know, her labor probably went super fast and her delivery hopefully went very smoothly. And she looked great throughout her pregnancy. Like you could still see her abs when she was like nine plus months pregnant. So that's an ideal. I think that if your body is, and even if you're not Sierra, and I was not, you know, even if you're, you're not in that top physical shape, but you are every day thinking about, you know, keeping yourself in the best shape that you can be during your pregnancy, it really will help you with your labor and delivery so that you probably won't need an epidural. So this is always your goal is to try to get yourself in the best shape that you can get before your baby is ready to be born and so that you can give yourself the most optimal outcome. So going back to what I said earlier about maternal mortality. So in the United States, it's still a very significant issue. Um, and this is across the board for women. That being said, you know, it's really important for you, um, especially if you're an expecting mom to really put yourself in a position to get the prenatal care that you need. If you're unable to, there are many, many resources. I'll list it at the end of the video and also link them in the description so that you guys can click and find out more information about gaining access to prenatal care and support while you're pregnant and also help you to develop a birth plan for when you're able and ready to deliver. So with that, I really appreciate this video um, that we watched because it does show you perspective that's non-medical, that's outside of, you know, the hospital confines. And in this time where people are very worried about you know, going to the hospital and getting infected and being exposed to, you know, potential risk of infections. A lot of people are gonna consider home birth and I think that, you know, in some settings and in some patient specific scenarios, it is appropriate. However, if you have, haven't gotten prenatal care and you don't have an assessment on your well being and your baby's health status, I believe that the safest thing for you to do is to be delivered in a hospital setting 
where you can be assessed and evaluated and your, your newborn, your neonate can also be assessed and evaluated for potential issues. I'm actually someone who doesn't really strongly believe that either thing is better, but I do know that we need to operate with information and an informed perspective so we need to learn about what each option presents the pros the cons and go forward with that so in the setting of a natural birth I would say pros are you're gonna be at home you're gonna be around a familiar environment of course in your own home you know where things are who's gonna be around you so you're familiar with the personalities of the people who are gonna attend your live birth hopefully you've worked with them before if there's gonna be a midwife there or um, a doula and they all have access to emergency contact information so where's the nearest hospital do they have neonatal ICU capacity how long will it take for you to get there those and how you're gonna get there those are things that you need to outline and plan beforehand and make sure that you always have a plan B whenever you're going into doing a natural birth those are definitely pros you're gonna be in your own space and you'll have access to all the things that will help relax you I think that you know not having done a home birth but having done an outside of the hospital birth it's really important to um, you know have within you those techniques and coping skills on how to deal with the pain of the control Attraction and um, you know just learning how to breathe during that time so you know it's really important I think to give yourself as much information as possible arm yourself with techniques to deal with either situation because in either situation it's going to be stress on your body and you're going to need to find ways to cope with that stress and to manage that stress so that you can have healthy outcome and with that I thank you guys so much for watching please like subscribe comment and let me know what your suggestions are for future videos in this realm because I do want to talk a lot about this for you know people who are interested in learning about the anesthesia component of you know labor and then those people who are interested in learning other topics that might be associated c-section spinals what to do if this happens what to do if that happens your story I want to hear it all so thank you so much please leave that information in the comments see you guys next time take care